1848, President Abraham Lincoln visited the Niagara Falls, and he was so impressed by the beauty of this natural wonder that he wrote down some notes, including the following. When Columbus first sought this continent, when Christ suffered on the cross, when Moses led Israel through the Red Sea, nay, even when Adam first came from the hand of his Maker, then, as now, Niagara was roaring here. The eyes of that species of extinct giants, whose bones fill the mounds of America, have gazed on Niagara, as ours do now. During the 19th century, there were many accounts of unnaturally large skeletal remains discovered in the ancient burial mounds scattered across North America. Today, not a single news media has ever mentioned a thing about ancient giants or past discoveries. If a giant skeleton is discovered somewhere, it would most certainly be classified and hidden from the public. It wasn't like that in the 19th and early 20th century, though. Almost every year, there were at least a few newspaper headlines stating the discovery of ancient giant skeletons. It seemed to be quite normal to find bones of giants in America when the first settlers dug ancient mounds to prepare for roads, farms, and buildings. The New York Times, in particular, wrote many newspaper articles about the discoveries of giants. Let's read through some of them starting with this one titled, The Bones of a Giant Found, which was published on May 25, 1882, and reads, A skull of heroic size and singular formation has been discovered among the relics of the mound builders in the Red River Valley. The mound was 60 feet in diameter and 12 feet high. Near the center were found the bones of about a dozen men and women mixed with the bones of various animals. The skull in question was the only perfect one, and near it were found some abnormally large body bones. The man who bore it was evidently a giant. A thorough investigation of the mound and its contents will be made by the Historical Society. Another newspaper from May 5, 1885 reads this. Last week, a small mound near Homer was opened by some schoolboys who found a skeleton. Today, a further search was made and several feet below the surface of the earth in a large vault with a stone floor and bark covering were found four huge skeletons, three being each over seven feet in length and the other eight. This article from the San Antonio Express is telling about a giant skull that is twice the size of a normal human, and there is also a picture. The article reads, Beach Giant Skull Unearthed by WPA Workers Near Victoria, believed to be largest ever found in the world. Normal head also found. That Texas had a giant in the beach in the long ago appears probable from the large skull recently unearthed on a mound in Victoria County believed to be the largest human skull ever found in the United States and probably in the world. Twice the size of the skull of a normal man, the fragments were dug up by W. Duffin, an archaeologist who is excavating the mound in Victoria County under a WPA project sponsored by the University of Texas. In the same mound and at the same level, a normal-sized skull was found. The pieces taken from the mound were reconstructed in the WPA laboratory under the supervision of physical anthropologists. A study is being made to determine whether the huge skull was that of a man belonging to a tribe of extraordinary large men, or whether the skull was that of an abnormal member of a tribe, a case of gigantism. Several large human bones have been unearthed at this site. Another article from the New York Times, written in 1897, reads, One of the three recently discovered mounds in this town has been opened. In it was found the skeleton of a man of gigantic size. The bones measured from head to foot over nine feet and were in a fair state of preservation. The skull was as large as a half bushel measure. Some finely tempered rods of copper and other relics were lying near the bones. The mound from which these relics were taken is 10 feet high and 30 feet long, 
and varies from 6 to 8 feet in width. The two mounds of lesser size will be excavated soon. This article from the St. Paul Globe, written in 1904, states, Bones of a human skeleton 11 feet high are dug up in Nevada. Workmen engaged in digging gravel here today uncovered at a depth of about 12 feet a lot of bones, part of the skeleton of a gigantic human being. Dr. Samuels examined them and pronounced them to be the bones of a man who must have been nearly 11 feet in height. Apparently, these discoveries were something completely normal back in the day, and they weren't hidden from the public as they are today. The discoveries of giant skeletons weren't limited just to North America. This article talks of a giant's skeletons found in a cave in Mexico. The article reads, Charles C. Klepp, who has recently returned from Mexico, where he has been in charge of Thomas W. Lawson's mining interest, has called the attention of Professor Agassiz to a remarkable discovery made by him. He found in Mexico a cave containing some 200 skeletons of men, each above 8 feet in height. The cave was evidently the burial place of a race of giants who antedated the Aztecs. Mr. Clapp arranged the bones of one of these skeletons and found the total length to be 8 feet 11 inches. Other articles mention discoveries of giants in Europe. This article from 1892, written by the London Globe, tells of the discovery of a race of giants in modern-day France. It reads, In the year 1890, some human bones of enormous size, double the ordinary in fact, were found in the tumulus of Castelnau and have since been carefully examined by Professor Kyener who, while admitting that the bones are those of a very tall race, nevertheless finds them abnormal in dimensions and apparently of morbid growth. They undoubtedly reopen the question of the giants of antiquity, but do not furnish evidence to decide it. You have no idea how many more newspaper articles we found. There were discoveries of giants all across the globe, and today, scientists and archaeologists pretend this never even happened. This article, titled, When Giants Roamed Earth, talks about the historical discoveries of giants from the time of the Roman Empire to the 19th century. Here's what it reads. The past was more prolific in the production of giants than the present. In 1830, one of these giants, who was exhibited at Rouen, was 10 feet high, and the giant Galabra, brought from Arabia to Rome in the time of Claudius Caesar, was the same height. Phanum, who lived in the time of Eugene II, was 11 and one-half feet in height. The Chevalier Scrog, in his journey to the peak Tenerife, found in one of the caverns of that mountain the head of a giant who had 60 teeth and who was not less than 15 feet high. The giant Faragus, slain by Orlando, the nephew of Charlemagne, according to reports, was 28 feet high. In 1814, near St. Gernard, was found the tomb of the giant Isolant, who was not less than 30 feet high. In 1590, near Rouen, was found a skeleton whose head held a bushel of corn and which was 19 feet in height. The giant Backert was 22 feet high. In 1623, near the castle in Dauphine, a tomb was found 30 feet long, 16 feet wide, and 8 feet high on which were cut in gray stone the words Cantolicus Rex. The skeleton was found entire and measured 25 and 1 fourth feet high, 10 feet across the shoulders, and 5 feet from breastbone to the back. But France is not the only country where giant skeletons have been unearthed. Near Palermo, Sicily, in 1516, was found the skeleton of a giant 30 feet high, Near Magrino, on the same island, in 1816, was found the skeleton of a giant of 30 feet, whose head was the size of a hog's head, and each tooth weighed 5 ounces. Although back in the days these discoveries were made public, once the discovered skeletons were brought to the respected museums and historical institutions, they completely disappeared and no one ever talked about them again. Here is a map of all reports of giants in North America. 
It's truly astonishing how many of them are there. Almost all of the discoveries end up in the Smithsonian Institute, and we all know how good they are at covering up major discoveries. There are also supposed reports of the Smithsonian purchasing giant skeletons excavated by citizens, which then disappeared, never to be heard from again. The Smithsonian even had a special division for exploring ancient mounds and supposed giant burial sites. One famous discovery of a giant which was also covered up by the Smithsonian is the San Diego Giant from 1895, which was an 8-foot, 4-inch tall mummified giant. There was even a picture of the giant mummy, which was shown in many newspapers. The mummy was inspected by many scientists. After his inspection, the San Diego Giant was purchased by the Smithsonian. Thirteen years later, in 1908, when the mummy was being exhibited, the Smithsonian ran some tests and suddenly dismissed it as a hoax, saying it was made from gelatin. The fact that it took that long, and after spending so much money to acquire it, plus the fact that it was carefully inspected by experts 13 years earlier, does suggest there may be more to this story than meets the eye. Is it just a coincidence that absolutely every culture and religion tells stories of ancient giants who roam the earth? The Sumerian civilization, which was said to have begun in approximately 6000 BC, tells of a race of giants which ruled over the Sumerians, and there are many depictions of them. Sumerian records speak of a giant king by the name of Gilgamesh, who ruled for 126 years. He is generally seen by scholars as an actual historical figure, since inscriptions have been found which confirm the existence of other figures associated with him. In ancient Egypt, there are hundreds of depictions of giants, and the Egyptian records describe the old pharaoh dynasties to be a race of tall giants, and hundreds of giant sarcophaguses were also found. But the mummies there had been long looted this unusual story, with a headline, Prehistoric Egyptian Giants, was reported in multiple newspapers and reads. In 1881, when Professor Timmerman was engaged in exploring the ruins of an ancient temple of Isis on the banks of the Nile, 16 miles below Najar Jafard, he opened a row of tombs in which some prehistoric race of giants had been buried. The smallest skeleton out of some 60-odd which were examined during the time Timmerman was excavating at Najar Jafard, measured 7 feet and 8 inches in length, and the largest, 11 feet 1 inch. Memorial tablets were discovered in great numbers, but there was no record that even hinted that they were in the memory of men of extraordinary size. It is believed that the tombs date back to the year 1043 BC. According to the German newspaper, Bild, an entrepreneur named Gregor Spori took a number of photos of a mummified giant finger in 1988. The owner of the finger was a retired grave robber who found the finger in an undisclosed tomb. The finger is nearly 14 inches long and, if it is genuine, it belonged to someone estimated to have been between 15 and 16 feet tall. The owner of the finger had a certificate to say that the finger was authentic, together with an X-ray image. Later, when Spori returned to Egypt to purchase the finger, the owner had disappeared, leaving us only with the photographs of this discovery. The Book of Genesis, which is the first book of the Hebrew Bible and the Old Testament, tells us the story of an ancient giant race called the Nephilim. Apparently, the Watchers, who were fallen angels, interbred with the women on earth, and as a result, the Nephilim giants were born. We know that these ancient manuscripts describe the Great Deluge, a massive flood which, according to scientific data, really happened. If the biblical flood was real, could the Nephilim giants also be real? The stories about giants don't end there. Every Native American tribe tells of the times when giants used to rule North America, and there were brutal wars between the giants and the Native Americans. The tribes had to unite together against a group of red-haired cannibalistic giants. 
and fought them to extinction. The existence of giants could certainly explain some of the massive megalithic structures around the world, like the Stone of the South at Baalbek, Lebanon, which weighs at a staggering 1,242 tons. On Mount Shoria in southern Siberia, researchers have found an absolutely massive wall of granite stones. Some of these gigantic granite stones are estimated to weigh more than 3,000 tons more than double the weight of those in Lebanon. It's interesting to note that the original name for Stonehenge was the Giant's Dance or the Giant's Ring. Stonehenge is a later Saxon name that translates to the Hanging Stones. Giants are also part of the Celtic mythology, the Greek and Roman mythology, the Hindus, Buddhist, Norse, and even in the Japanese Shinto folklore. There are many historical accounts of giants as well. Flavius Josephus, a first century Jewish scholar and historian wrote this, for which reason they removed their camp to Hebron, and when they had taken it, they slew all the inhabitants. There were till then left the race of giants, who had bodies so large and countenances so entirely different from other men that they were surprising to the sight and terrible to the hearing. The bones of these men are still shown to this very day, unlike to any credible relations of other men. During the 1500s, when the Spanish navigators were exploring the coast of the Americas, sightings of live giants were also sighted. Three captains of Spanish ships reported these taller-than-average native people on their expeditions to America, as well as Sir Francis Drake, Captain John Smith, and several other notable eyewitnesses. This is what Captain John Smith wrote about them. The Sasquasahanogs are a giant-like people. They measured the calf of the largest man's leg and found it three quarters of a yard about, and all the rest of his limbs were in proportion. In 1519, Spanish explorer Alonso Alvarez de Pineda was mapping the coastline of the Gulf Coast, marking the various rivers, bays, landmarks, and potential ports. Not far from where the river empties into the Gulf of Mexico, he found a large town and near it some 40 native villages. He described seeing many giants living in this village and curiously, a race of tiny pygmies was also living there. Pineda described the tribes that settled near the Mississippi River as a race of giants from 10 to 11 palms in height and a race of pygmies only five or six palms high. Perhaps the most intriguing and widely known tale of real giants in the Age of Exploration began with an account concerning none other than the great Portuguese explorer Ferdinand Magellan. Between the years of 1519 and 1522, Magellan embarked on his most famous voyage, a bold expedition to search for a good route to the Maluku Islands of the East East Indies that would eventually result in the first successful circumnavigation of the globe. Magellan was given command of five vessels, and one leg of their voyage took them out across the vast ocean, all the way to the faraway land of Patagonia, at the southern end of South America. It was there that the expedition would come across a rather baffling sight indeed. Here's an excerpt from the diary of Magellan's official chronicler. Leaving that place, we finally reached 49 and one half degrees toward the Antarctic Pole. As it was winter, the ships entered a safe port to winter. We passed two months in that place without seeing anyone. One day, we suddenly saw a naked man of giant stature on the shore of the port, dancing, singing, and throwing dust on his head. The Captain General, Magellan, sent one of our men to the giant so that he might perform the same actions as a sign of peace. Having done that, the man led the giant to an islet into the presence of the Captain General. When the giant was in the Captain General's and our presence, he marveled greatly and made signs with one finger raised upward, believing that we had come from the sky. He was so tall that we reached only to his waist and he was well proportioned. It is significant to note that the above narrative is taken from the journal of the official chronicler of Magellan's voyage of discovery. 
That is the one person above all others who is tasked with recording and keeping the most accurate records of events and activities, whether exotic or mundane. This person is not only responsible to the commander of the voyage, but also to king and country for his eyewitness accounts as a complete, precise, and accurate testimony of events that occurred during the voyage. Based on his position and responsibilities alone, his first-hand eyewitness testimony of encounters with giants must be taken as factual information by an unimpeachable witness. To do otherwise is to trivialize the importance of the chronicler's fundamental accountability. Years later, in 1539, there was also the account of Hernando de Soto, another explorer, who came face to face with numerous giants during his adventures through the southeast portion of what is now the United States. De Soto had set out from Tampa Bay, Florida with a contingent of hundreds of men, and during their trek, they allegedly frequently came across tribes of natives ruled by giants. One of these was a Chief Tuscaloosa, who was encountered in western Alabama and said to be a hulking giant of a man who towered over all others. There are also the reports from the Spanish conquistador and explorer Hernando de Alarcón, who was trying to find a river that could be used to move supplies to Spanish troops along the coasts of California and Mexico. Alarcón would eventually make his way up the Colorado River all the way up to the Grand Canyon, and during this journey, he and his men purportedly came across a tribe of around 200 giant warriors standing up to 10 feet tall. The giants were supposedly very aggressive, but Alarcón appeased them with gifts and other signs of peace. The conquistador Francisco Coronado also told of having come across whole tribes of giants during his quest throughout the Southwest in search of the legendary El Dorado. In some cases, there was physical evidence of these giants found, as was supposedly the case with the conquistador Bernal Diaz del Castillo, who served under Hernán Cortés during the Spanish conquest of Mexico. Within the pages of his detailed record of the conquest and subsequent collapse of the Aztec Empire, there is an odd account of a race of giants that were claimed by the Tlaxcatec Indians to have once inhabited the area. The chief of the tribe then provided the remains of these mysterious giants as evidence of which Castillo would write, They said their ancestors had told them that very tall men and women with huge bones had once dwelt among them. But because they were very bad people with wicked customs, they had fought against them and killed them, and those of them who remained had died off. And to show us how big these giants had been, they brought us the leg bone of one, which was very thick, and the height of an ordinary sized man. And that was a leg bone from the hip to the knee. I measured myself against it, and it was as tall as I am, though I am of a reasonable height. They brought over pieces of bone of the same kind, but they were all rotten and eaten away by the soil. We were all astonished by the sight of these bones and felt certain there must have been giants in that land. There were so many reports of real giants being encountered throughout North and South America in the age of exploration, and such accounts have faded into history to be mostly forgotten. There are some things, however, that cannot be forgotten, as they are literally written in stone. That's the case of the giant footprint of South Africa. This is the most spectacular footprint in rock found anywhere on Earth to date. There are many others, however, like the giant footprint of Pinyan, but none are as fully formed and obvious as the one in South Africa. Discovered in 1931 by a farmer called Stoffel Ketzi while hunting, it has remained one of the most controversial sites in archaeology and geological research. The footprint is about 4 feet or 1.3 meters in length, which suggests that the creature who left it would have been 24 to 27 feet or 7 to 8 meters in height. The footprint is known to locals as the footprint of God, or Goliath's footprint, and stories of ancient giants are told all throughout the region. Skeptics reject the giant footprint, claiming it was formed by natural erosion. However, Professor Peter Wagoner from the University of Port Elizabeth in South Africa said that, 
There is a higher probability of little green men arriving from space and licking it out with their tongues than being created by natural erosion. Judging by all the discoveries listed, together with all the historical accounts we mentioned, giants really existed. But could it be possible that somewhere, in some remote place, a species of these enigmatic beings is still alive, hiding from humanity? We can't end this video without mentioning the most famous giant encounter, which didn't happen in ancient times, but in 2002. This occurrence, which is still classified by the U.S. government, was disclosed in the popular radio show Coast to Coast, after witnesses of the event came through and anonymously told their stories. The events allegedly happened in 2002 in the deserts of Afghanistan, where a U.S. Army squad went missing. We would come back to the base and we started hearing this rumor about a unit that killed uh, this, what they started calling this really tall person. At first I didn't think anything of it, and then come to find out that the uh, person that they killed actually was three times the size of a man, had extra digits on their hand and digits on their feet, and had red hair, and uh, a special unit had come in and wanted this uh, target. You were in Afghanistan in 2002, and you were called into a very remote section of Afghanistan because a patrol um, had basically gone missing. Exactly. Okay. Exactly. There's well, no villages around, around nothing. for miles. Right. So very remote. remote. Yeah, very remote. So we flew in. For about four clicks, kilometers. We're hiking through the same area where they were supposed to make one of their checkpoints, you know, one of their rally points. And before we'd left, there was all kinds of what happened with the ambush, but that was even odd because at the point of ambush, you'd call for maybe close air support or something, okay. okay? There was no calls made, you just off the, off the bridge. So we're coming down a, a mountainside, and there was a nice, nice path, a goat path. As we bent around this corner, you could see this opening of the cave. There's a cave as we're coming around. And then I see there's a lot of rocks, which is another oddity, and then bone matter. When I'm not close enough to identify what kind of bones, but I did see something I knew was a piece of our communications equipment. So instantly, we're thinking ambush, maybe animal, you know, it could be anything. And there was enough room in front of this cave, but it had a sheer drop off. But there was enough room that we actually got into a, a decent dispersal in case of ambush. You see something coming out of the cave, and it's moving with a speed and agility that catches you off guard. Everybody. Everybody. And he comes out. It was a man at least 12 to 15 feet in height. This is a monster. Red beard, then his hair was long past the shoulder. A scarlet red, and Dan runs at him and starts shooting, which broke all of us into the reality. Because it was so, so now, real. Now your training is kicking Oh yeah, okay. muscle memory. Right. Complete muscle memory. While Dan is moving at him, another bro of mine's laying down fire and I start firing. He skewers Dan. He's now got him on this pike. It went through him. He's still got him. And he's coming after more. We all just clicked in. I don't know what it was, but I remember we're all like, shoot him in the face, shoot him in the face. Our weapons components were in four. We had 308s and we had Barrett 50s. This is sounding longer than it took. We're talking 30 seconds. And he's taking multiple hits and it's still moving. He talked about this giant being 1,100 pounds, anywhere from 10 to 15 feet long. Uh, and it was killed. It was uh, apparently shot uh, somewhere in a cave in Afghanistan. Uh, and uh, But before it was shot, it lunged at uh, several of our troops, our soldiers. It may have even gorged somebody. 
uh, it was just a bizarre, bizarre story. And it just sounds like the Nephilim from the Bible. And you have to assume that the giant is not alone, that the giant is not the only being living on this planet. There's got to be a whole school of them somewhere. Uh, you know, maybe he's got a female uh, mate. Maybe he's got children. Who knows? Um, unfortunate that uh, he had to attack our soldiers rather than uh, be somewhat peaceful. But uh, I guess that comes with the uh, with the territory. Dan was dead. Okay. And uh, why is a good man, probably one of the best men I know, now dead? Before I'd left, they were already starting what they call a nine line, which is a medevac request. They're sending out a medevac request, then all of a sudden it's not a medevac request. All of a sudden we had a helicopter show up because like I told you, it was a large precipice and a sheer drop. So the helicopter just came up from the drop. They had dropped netting, which is like uh, cargo netting. It's like squares. We were told we had to bundle him up. And we get another bigger helicopter, but it's almost like a jolly green giant used to look back in the day that could get you know, through this area. Because the mountains, you gotta remember, Chinooks could only go in certain places because they had enough lift. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we got him on there. The thing was too big, we couldn't move it. It smelled worse than a skunk. A corpse that's been around for a while. Really fell. Oh, it was like a combination because of the, how do you put that, the persistence of a skunk smell. Once the helicopter came in, dropped its little hook, and off he goes. The communication was sent out that we had a very large, possible human creature. There you are in the, the hills of Afghanistan. Uh, how many troop members are you with? We had uh, six on my crew. And uh, when we say hills of Afghanistan, uh, for us, we did not fly into the wilderness. We actually flew into a base. Uh, I guess this thing was transloaded out of the uh, mountains by a CH-47. But I could see that it did have the six fingers. I remember taking my foot up and placing it up next to its foot, and it was extremely large. We estimated at about 12 feet, give or take. Uh, what I can tell you is the weight of the thing, basically, it was approximately 1,500 pounds when it was getting on the aircraft. Now, if you take away the pallet weight and all the rigging that we had to uh, hold this thing down, we figured it was around uh, 1,100 pounds. Of course we're upset. That's a given. Okay. We lost a very good guy. But add to that, <clears throat> you're discussing something that even in our after action report, they're saying rewrite it. And we had to rewrite it the way they wanted. How, how many fingers? Six. Oh, six. Six, and six toes. And six toes. And the nails were weird because if you see somebody that ever has I don't know what it's called, but it's like, like a fungus, a on, fungus on the nails, how they get pointy and they're like gnarly. That's, That's what they look like. And people have a right to know about this stuff. I mean, if, if there are 15 footers or 18 footers ro roaming the planet and our military has brought them down, I mean, we have a right as American citizens. I mean, this isn't classified military stuff. This is something that we need to know. And it points back to the biblical prophetic narrative. What are your thoughts on that? I think, uh, Here's, here's my personal opinion. My personal opinion is if it points that the Bible's accurate, they don't want it. Uh, if it goes against Darwinian evolution, it's not to be spoken of. So you're out in the boonies running around looking for high value targets. Correct. Okay. And we're doing those operations and uh, as we're getting into firefights, we're getting into different uh, scrimmages, you want to put it that way, we would come back to the base and we started hearing this rumor about a unit that killed uh, this well, they started calling this really tall person. At first, I didn't think anything of it. Then come to find out that the uh, person that they killed actually was three times the size of a man, had extra digits on their hand and digits on their feet, and had red hair. And uh, a special unit had come in and wanted this uh, target. Well, we'd heard that they were had killed this thing inside a cave or the mouth of a cave. and. Uh, it was common knowledge among the military to hear this. Now, when you say common knowledge, what do you mean? I mean, how does that work? Years later, to come to find out when I had returned from Afghanistan and had met other uh, military members that had not been there in the operations with me, 
uh, if you would bring up the giant of Kandahar, they knew about it. When you first hear it, you're thinking like, this is, uh, this has got to be a joke. This has got to be a hoax. But then after things go down a certain way and you keep hearing it, you start to realize it's, it's not a joke. They kept telling us to keep our, our weapons high, which means normally it's two to the chest, one to the head, but they kept telling us to put it towards a man's head and put it higher. So we would question why do they want us to shoot higher than a man's That's head? That's bizarre. So it is. Our contact said 2002 is when they had they shot this this 15 footer or taller, and you're now in 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 this you know in the service around 2005. This word has gotten out, and what I find interesting here too is that if you're going to create a hoax, I get that. But you've got details, six fingers, red hair, double rows of teeth, six digits on the toes. And of course, that brings it right back into what we hear about in the biblical prophetic narrative, specifically the Nephilim. Your thoughts? I, I agree. Uh, I will tell you that uh, when I was doing my time in the service, and the stuff I saw, some of it I couldn't uh, explain, like lights in the sky during firefights, like orbs or... Uh, lights would be the size of a, a softball that looked that size looking up in the sky but making weird noises. And, and even going to Iraq myself and, and being near Haditha Dam and knowing, seeing the prisoners underneath the, the, the dam and the prisoners would scream and there would be this awful feeling underneath the dam and then later finding out in the Bible that um, angels locked underneath there were talks about. And this Haditha Dam is the Euphrates. Is Euphrates, and correct. And an angel supposedly locked underneath the Euphrates. Correct. Which is released in the book of Revelation. That's correct. That's bizarre. So you're actually at this site, and soldiers are being locked in prison underneath the Haditha Dam, Correct. and they're freaking yeah, out. They're freaking out. They said they could feel it. In fact, the uh, people who would guard them would uh, they would draw straws to see who would actually take them. No one, no one wanted to go down. Nobody wants to go down. Going back to Afghanistan, we would hear these things. We would hear the locals talk about rumors of these giants. What would the locals say? How would they talk about it? They say that they lived in the caves and they would eat people. And uh, They were cannibals. They were cannibals. If there was a living giant hiding for so many years in the caves of Afghanistan without being discovered, we must assume that this giant must not be the only one living on this planet. Surely there must be others somewhere out there. This mysterious creature was caught on camera in the desert of Portugal a few years ago. Could it be another giant hiding from mankind? Thinking about all the classified discoveries out there, we should be lucky to know that dinosaurs existed. If that was kept a secret, who would actually believe that creatures over 175 feet in height used to exist? And if we know for a fact that giant reptiles, giant birds, giant fish, and giant plants used to exist on Earth, is it so hard to believe that giant humanoids also existed and perhaps still do? We'll leave the answer to you and end this video with this amazing quote from Mark Twain stating, Truth is stranger than fiction, but it is because fiction is obliged to stick to possibilities. Truth isn't. <laughs>